We'll wait one second to get started as everyone enters into the webinar room. Okay, cool. Hello, I'm Ayana Thompson, the director of the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies at Arizona State University. Thank you for joining us today for our 2020 Distinguished Lecture. This installment of the Distinguished Lecture Series is funded by the Strategic Initiative Funding from the President's Office at Arizona State University, the Virginia G. Piper Center for Creative Writing, and the Center for Science and the Imagination and we are so grateful for their support. The lecture series brings together contemporary artists, writers, actors, directors, and scholars who engage the past to imagine different, more inclusive futures. We invited Nettie Okorfor to be our speaker this year because her work engages the culture, history, and mythology of pre-modern and contemporary Nigeria to create futuristic narratives that implicitly challenge white Western ones. Nedia Korfor is a Nigerian American author and her works include Who Fears Death, the Binti Novella Trilogy, The Book of Phoenix, The Akata Books and Lagoon. She is the winner of Hugo, Nebula, World Fantasy, Locus and Lodestar Awards and her debut novel, Zara the Windseeker won the prestigious Wole Soyenka prize for literature. Her newest novel, Ikenga, is now in stores. Nettie is also, has also written comics for Marvel, including Black Panther, Long Live the King, and Wakanda Forever. She is also the co-writer of the film adaptation of Octavia Butler's Wild Seed, starring Viola Davis. Matt Bell, the director of creative writing here at ASU will be in conversation with Nettie and we're so grateful to have his participation because we can't imagine anyone more perfect to do this. Matt's novel, Appleseed, is forthcoming in 2000, 2021. His craft book, Refuse to be Done, a guide to novel writing, rewriting and revision will follow in 2022. He is also the author of the novels Scrapper and in the House, Upon the Dirt, Between the Lake, and In the Woods, as well as the short story collection, A Tree, or a Person, or a Wall. A few quick things before I turn it over to our speakers. We have live closed captioning available throughout the event. If you would like to take advantage, please hit the CC button at the bottom of your screen. If you're watching today on the Zoom webinar, you can pose a question through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen as well. And if you'd like to support ACMRS to be able to host more events like this one, please consider giving a donation at acmrs.asu.edu slash give. Thank you again for joining us and thank you Nettie and Matt for joining us today. Thanks. Hi Nettie, thank you so much for, for being here with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm really glad to get to be in conversation with you. I'm such a fan of your writing and your, your work. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, if you're ready, I'll just dive in with some questions. Yeah, let's go. Um, I, because we're, we're here talking global medievalism and uh, African futurism, I thought maybe we'd start sort of in a broad sort of definition, definitional sort of way, just to, uh, to have us all on the same page for the people who are listening. Um, in a blog post last October, you laid out definitions for African futurism and African jujuism, contrasting them with the earlier term Afrofuturism. You wrote that African futurism is a subcategory of science fiction, specifically and more directly rooted in African culture, history, mythology, and point of view as it then branches into the Black diaspora and does not privilege or center the West. 
while African Jujuism is a subcategory of fantasy that respectfully acknowledges the seamless blend of true existing African spiritualities and cosmologies with the imaginative. Um, as I understand it, your blog post was uh, in part an attempt to redirect the way your work was being read. And as you said, mm -hmm. to regain control of how you were being defined as a writer. Um, I wondered if you could talk about what you see as the distinct possibilities of African futurism and African Jujuism. Did defining those terms uh, for yourself make new stories or ideas or ways of writing possible for you? Um, in other words, like what power is there for you in those kind of namings for the writing you're doing or uh, championing? Um, I think that, okay, let me see if I can, I can focus because that was, there was several questions <laughs> in one and you're probably gonna have to remind me of what some of those those questions um, sure. uh, were, but but like the reason why I even came up with these because like typically when when I'm with my stories I don't I'm not really about the categories I don't care for categories I feel like they confine um, they confine creativity and and put an expectation on what I'm doing that the, I, I like the freedom of do, uh, telling whatever kind of stories that I want but but in this case I felt like what I was writing was being read in a way that was being read through a lens that was, it was like, it wasn't even a lens. It was more like a net. And that mm -hmm. net was ca catching aspects of the stories that I was writing. And, um, and therefore the readers were missing things. They were like, it was like sifting things out and then focusing on other things. And so like, that was why I felt I needed to, um, I needed to create this, this, this category. It's not just for my own stories. It was more like creating a space. There needs to be a space for these kinds of stories and these kinds of imaginings. Um, with African Jujuism, there needed to be a space because without that category, um, stories that are delving into African spiritualities of any kind are those, those spiritualities and that, that those cosmologies and mysticism are going to be read as just fantasy. In other words, things that are just made up, that have no, no base in anything. And I, I needed to, I needed to speak to that because there are a lot, especially when it comes to African literature and like um, African Jujuism kind of complicates the idea ideas that were that have been complicated for a while with the category of let's say magical realism because magical realism is to me is problematic in that it labels the worldviews not the worldviews that are non-western and which tend to be you know people of color um as as other as other and like where kind of all over the place with this but where um certain worldviews may see the mystical and the mundane being just something that we are that is that that are always mingled that are always part of each other um that's a world view that's not a different you know that that's not the other and so magical real like those those things are often slapped with the label of magical realism and that's problematic so african jujuism is is kind of addressing something similar um to that argument and that discussion around magical realism it's just that african jujuism focuses it very closely on africa yeah so yeah there's a lot more to that, but yeah. Yeah, I know that, <laughs> what were the other parts of your question? Did, did I cover all of it or? I think we, I can, we work through it. We don't have to be, okay. I'm okay. starting out okay. formally because I don't want to mess up, but uh, we don't have to be so formal either. Um, you know, as, as I was reading that definition of, of African Jews and listening to you talk, I, I felt myself sort of spark at like exactly what you're talking about, the blend of true existing African spiritualities um, and, mm -hmm. and how to keep that from being read as fantasy. Um, even in a fantasy mm -hmm. novel, right? Um, yeah. I grew up Catholic in like a very uh, like sincere Catholic culture that believed like uh, like angels were literally real. And so like, you know, to write about that would have been realism for me from that point of view, mm -hmm. right? And, and I right. think um, uh, that's, this seems somewhat related to that in a different context, right? There's sort of this mm -hmm. acknowledging the complex reality of a worldview as opposed mm -hmm. to... Um, making a fantasy or realism distinction. Yeah, and also addressing that idea of the stigmas that are often heaped upon African spiritualities and mysticism and all of that, like they're, they're viewed as primitive, they're viewed as, you know, we've got colonial, the, the colonialist staff coming in and marking those things as, as primitive, as evil, as, you know, barbaric. 
And so we've got that whole dynamic with that too. So yeah, yeah, it's a lot of like the, the you know, my, my need for, for creating that category was, was multi-pronged and it was, you know, um, it's, it's weird that, it, that na but names are powerful. When you name something, it almost comes into existence and, and it, it's better understood. So, so there's that aspect. So my dislike of categories that I have to put that aside when I'm, you know, when I'm addressing these issues in this way. Yeah, that makes makes total sense to me. I wondered if I could also ask you, I really liked your idea of like Afrofuturism being a net that was catching some things, not other things. There were things that were not passing through. Um, I, I was trying to think of if I had an example of that, but I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I do exactly. But I was wondering if you could maybe say like, what is something that Afrofuturism blocks a person from maybe seeing or noticing as opposed to in an African futurist story? Is there something that you can't see when you're looking at through that lens? Well, I mean, if you're looking at something as Afrofuturist versus looking at that African futurist thing, like my stories, <laughs> okay, if you're looking at my stories as Afrofuturist, you're going to think that the, for example, Binti, Binti will, if it's read through, I'm just going to say these things. I'm, I'm yeah. just, you know, I, hey, I open the can of worms and it's like people get irritated, they get irritated. But if you read Binti through an Afrofuturist lens versus an African futurist lens, it's Binti is in a future that could have been, you know, we're, we're, we're like, we're dreaming. And I don't see Binti as dreaming. I see Binti as that's a future that can happen if certain things happen in this sort of way. So like that's, and, and, and like um, Binti is not, I'm not taking, um, I'm not, and, and I'm not taking cosmetically taking uh, Himba qualities in the look. You know, she is Himba. Binti is Himba. So, like, and this is in the far future. So, so those those cultural aspects. So, so the way I see it is that those people who are in this future um, future part of Africa. I say part, and I don't mention the country because, like, Binti is like what five hundred. It's it's oh, it's far future. So, so the names of um, countries has shifted around and, 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 and things have blended, all of that. So that's why I don't specifically name a name, but normally I would, when I'm talking about a place in, like with Ikenga, I can tell you exactly where that is. And th those things are um, a concern with mine, like as an African futurist writer, it's not just Africa, you know, it's not an imagined anything. It is something that exists. So, so Binti, the, the Himba people of Binti in this far future, they are like that because of, how they've developed over time from now, you know, from past to now to the future. That's all connected and the, all, the past, present and the future all affect each other. You know, they're all, they're, they're all part of the story. And so that's, that's, the diff that's one of the differences. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's one of the things that I think I like so much about the Binti novellas is that like the kind of unbroken line that you're drawing or, or complicated line from like uh, a historical past into a present into this like to imagine a people into the future and imagine not only uh, existence and thriving the future, but also just like how how a culture will change, how what becomes possible as a culture exists mm -hmm. 500 years into the future. Um, feels exciting to sort of to do that kind of speculative work um, and to have the culture exchange be human alien as opposed to, you know, in, in a different. Yeah. Sort of, yeah. Um, it seems yeah. both exciting and also, of course, it's just fun, right? Like, sort of, yeah. <laughs> really feel the so joy fun. in those books so as well. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you so much. I think that's really clarifying. I think that, that helps a lot. Uh, I wanted to talk specifically about sort of working from uh, these spiritualities and folklores. Um, I don't always know when the time limit on spoilers runs out. So I'll just let you I know, decide. I <laughs> Can you, is yeah. it spoiling a book? talk about a book? Um, I don't think so, but I'll phrase the so question <laughs> carefully and you can decide what you want to reveal about uh, Lagoon. Um, so in, in an essay online, you wrote, uh, I should love spiders for I love stories. For me, stories snap the world into focus, add new dimensions, hybridize old ones, and present me with a new vocabulary of spells and sounds. Um, and your novel, Lagoon, includes a version of the storytelling spider, uh, Udide Okwanka, a uh, figure from Igbo folklore, I believe, who also appears, uh, I think, on the cover of Akat uh, Warrior as well, or as yeah. in single form, at least. Um, yeah, yeah. 
what is it about Udide Okwanka that made him such a <laughs> compelling mythical figure to you? And what did sort of thinking about him or drawing from his tales like make possible in Lagoon? Um, gosh, how do I even, that, okay, so I have a weird relationship with spiders. Yeah. So there's that, like I can tell, I have a weird, first and foremost, I'm terrified. I'm utterly, deeply terrified and it's completely irrational. Like when I see one, one just yesterday just came down from the ceiling right there next to me and I just everything on this desk was on the floor <laughs> and I was over there very quickly and it was not that big of a spider what? so like there's something that inspires this visceral like very uh primal something in me and it's not that oh spiders are poisonous no, no it's something irrational and I don't even know so that's always there and so when I'm writing one of the things that that um I I've always kind of one of the, the rules, like an unwritten rule for me as a writer is if it scares me and if it bothers me, I know that's the direction I should go in. So there's that, there's that. Um, and also spiders have just popped up in strange ways. Like I could tell you stories about um, the role of spiders when I was writing Who Fears Death. There was one spider that did something that where I'm like, people don't believe me when I tell this story, <laughs> but it was true. And it involved a very, very large spider that kept appearing after I killed it in very different kinds mm -hmm. of, anyway. So yeah, so spiders have this, this, this um, hold this place for me. And so, you know, so, so there's that. And then, I don't know, I, I stumbled across Udide like in this weird roundabout way where like it was just, it was just about a paragraph and it was in this piece of, I, I was, I'm very much, um, I love the, you know, the academic databases and the journals and all of that. And I stumbled across this one paragraph in this very, very old journal that just talked about Udide. And it talked about her, it was, it was like Udide is neither male nor female, sometimes female, sometimes male, um, sometimes neither. Um, and, and the storytelling, the storytelling um, great, um, I, I can't remember exactly how it was put, but storytelling spider, a great spider. And when I read that, I was like, oh, yeah. this is just, I, I just knew like every, every so often I just find something where I know it's big and I know it's very, very important. And like, I couldn't find any other references to each, like no other references anywhere. Um, and so as soon as I read that, I knew, and it just shelved in the back of my mind. And then I sat down to write, uh, it was either both a, a, a I can't even remember which one I wrote first anymore. It's kind of run together. Might have been Lagoon. And it just, you know, it, 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 she, she just kind of crept into the story. She just crept in and it just, she just made sense. She just made sense. And like, I can't even like, um, I can't, it, it's one of those, it's that artist thing where I can't quite explain, but I know, but I know the, uh, the power of the spider. And I, and then I also know, like, I do a lot of research about spiders and uh, just on a just on a biological level, yeah. which is sort of like self torture. I don't know why I do that. I just <laughs> find them very. I find, I'm terrified of them, but I find them very interesting as well. So it's just just all of that, all of that kind of made it become this thing in, in my stories. And and since then, you know, spiders appear in all like almost all of my stories at some point. But it's just become she's Udide is just this now this underlying thing that kind of connects almost everything that I've written, if that even makes sense. But that's it how it is in my sense, mind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, a, a decision that became uh, obvious to me that I was making pretty early in, in writing, once I had like more than one book, right, was that way in which you're deciding like to give something up between books or whether you're like letting things connect between books, right? That's sort of like, if like yeah. if spiders can appear in all the books, spiders can appear in all the books. It's okay. There'll be this sort of yeah. underpinning of it in that way. Um, mm -hmm. it, seems, uh, it seems exciting, right? You're working with mythology and you're creating your own uh, internal, consistent sort of cosmology of your work by, by that too, which feels um, thrilling, I think, yeah. and, and interesting to see. Um, can I ask about uh, another about Lagoon? There's the, the bone collector, the sort of like sentient yes, the bone collector. highway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you're working with some like existing sort of folk things, but you're also like making folklore out of like the features of the country or the features of the land. Yeah. And I wonder if you could talk yeah. about that there. I think that's such yeah. an interesting. Yeah, both those things in the same book is exciting. Yeah. 
and the the bone yeah the bone collector has the same vibe um and the bone collector uh, yeah i've written more about the bone <laughs> just you know more more is coming about the bone collector. oh interesting right? um yeah oh yeah oh yeah i knew that wasn't going to go away I, I, sometimes i wished it would but um <laughs> the first time i wrote about the bone collector was in a short story called on the road which is being adapted into a graphic novel um right. called after the rain and that's coming out in january i think and right. that was the first and only horror story i have ever written because i'm a big scaredy cat like i get scared like i couldn't finish lovecraft country <laughs> couldn't finish that <laughs> I get scared very easily, like a commercial can scare me. And so I wrote, the, and I, I would be very good at writing horror, but like I wrote this story and it scared me so badly. Like I was scared of roads for two weeks because of a story that I wrote. <laughs> um, the, 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 uh, the foundation of the bone collector comes from my trips to Nigeria, especially in my teens when we used to do a lot of, we used to do this drive from Lagos to Port Harcourt. And like that drive was treacherous. <laughs> and um, on those drives and, and on other drives as well, there are things that it, we saw on the road. You know, it's always on the road, the road. And so growing up, the Nigerian road was where, um, was like the place where the issues of Nigeria were most, in focus, you know? So it was the road, like you could see it because we'd take these long drives and the, and the thing, the, the worst things that I've seen and I love Nigeria and the, the best things that have ever happened to me have been there. But the worst things that I've seen in my life have been on the road, you know? So like that's always stayed with me. So even before I was writing stories, this was something that was always you know, in my mind and that with my sisters, my sisters were all one year apart and we all experienced all this together. We always talk about the road. Mm -hmm. We always talk about the road. We talk about the road, like the road at night, because when we would drive, it would be, um, we'd, we'd have to worry about, you know, carjackers. And, and then even when we get to the village, the village would be, the roads would be completely water, they would be um, dirt roads, water damage, the car would almost tip over, you'd think you were going into a ditch, like all kinds of, not, not just ditch, like a pit, right. you know, um, while there's like jungle on both sides and you don't, you can't see anything in front of you or behind. So like, those are things that are always just etched in my, in my memory, in my identity, all of that. So, so when I sat down to write the, when I wrote this short story on the road, it just all came together. And it came together in the form of the bone collector. And it was like the, the road was alive and it was connected. It was connected to, and it would connect to the spirit world. Um, and it was, and it needed to be fed. It needed to eat and it needed to be fed. And so that, and then also um, reading, I've read Famished, uh, Ben Okri's Famished Road mm. multiple times. And that's always been like, that's, of all the of all the novels, that one has probably affected me most, like in multiple ways. But like he talks about the road being like a river, and like you know, that that also kind of um, led to just this idea of the bone collector. And so that it was in that short story that it solidified into this thing. It's almost haunted. It's a beast, and it it shapeshifts and it swallows. Um, and then, it, and then it, you bring in is, issues of environmentalism because it smells like tar, and it's just, and it's, it's invading and scarring the land. There's so much, you know. So yeah, the road, and so now it's appeared in. I was just about to give away a huge spoiler, and I didn't, so I stopped myself. That was great, good for me. But like, yeah, Lagoon, I explored it even more. Like Lagoon, it, um, I explored it, in, 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 and and it's even more realized in Lagoon, and then and so on. Yeah, and so on. <laughs> uh, really, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I you know, I think um, like the way that it's like a focal point in the novel, where we keep coming back there, and sort of the same, and yeah. also that it's a focal point, like in your imagination, right? Like it's a, it's this place where like yeah. memory and imagination and, and sort of uh, geography are sort of intersecting in a, mm -hmm. a generative way, right? Mm -hmm. and obviously, because it keeps mm -hmm. producing. I'm just saying, producing, trying to trap you into telling me the new thing. Um, <laughs> um, maybe we're already talking about this. So on my mind. No, 
it's always a fun <laughs> thing, right? When you do kind of these events where like the thing that's present for you is a thing you can't talk about for two years and then you talk about yeah. you wrote five years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's always a little, uh, yes, uh, odd. Um, we're, I think we're already sort of talking about this a little bit, but I wondered if you could talk about how, uh, maybe how you began the work of drawing from, I think myth or history. I think you're also working with like mm -hmm. history and politics. And I mean, you obviously are in so many ways, um, but working from the, the mythical or the spiritual or the historical uh, toward like an imagined possible future. Like how do you, how do you do the mental work of sort of extending that? Um, I'll give you like a false binary and then you can do whatever you want with it. Okay. Um, okay. Are you more interested in sort of extending uh, Nigerian or African myths and histories into African futurist worlds or is it in building futures inspired by those myths and histories? So is it resetting those things in the future or is it about bringing from the past forward or present forward? I think, um... I think it's bringing from the past forward. This, and this is something I haven't thought about before, which is interesting, but I think it is bringing from the past um, forward, like bringing, because I, I think about Binti and I think about one of the, the main themes of Binti is that she, you know, we have this, this, um, this Himba girl who ends up leaving the planet. She gets into the finest university and she um, leaves her family which she loves, so she's not running from anything. She leaves her family because she wants to go and learn at this amazing university. And when she goes, she doesn't, and this is something I think I think about a lot, uh, where when people leave, this need to adapt, or not adapt, no, not adapt. This need to conform, you know, to where you're going, you have to become like them over there. And um, with Binti, she doesn't do that. With Binti, and she, she goes as who she is. When she leaves, she leaves with all of her, you know, she's covered in her ojitsu and she's, uh, she has her, her clothing and her own cultural ways. And she still wants to go and she leaves. And she's, she's, put, she, where she's sitting in a chair and she leaves prints of it on the chair. Mm -hmm. um, she brings her culture with her in her pursuit of the, the future, let's say, if we're going to use that as a metaphor, in her pursuit of the future, she brings her culture with her. And that culture is, turns out to be the thing that, um, that heals, you know, that, that it, it heals others. And it, um, and it's something that people can draw from over there, you know, so, so, so like this idea of bringing from the, bringing from the past, bringing from um, and to me, culture is alive. So it's not like, I don't see culture as a practice of the past. It is something that just, it, it changes and shifts and, and evolves, but it's, it's, uh, it's very much, it's not something uh, from the past. So, but like she brings, she brings her culture with her wherever she goes and it affects those places that she goes to. So I think that's really a good um, example. And she eventually goes home as well. And then she right. goes back. You know, so it's like, I think that's a, a good way to, um, to summarize the way um, my, my general philosophy of this. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think Binti is such a nice example of the way in which that bring forward, um, it's necessary for, uh, for Binti to take that out into space, into the university and have it, have it interact and also bring it back. You know, there's, you talk about yeah. like warming when you go out and then you come back and you're different and you have to like, adapt or reconform back and really what she ends mm -hmm. up with is like a, a synthesis right and yeah that, that sort yeah. of hybridity that like butler talks about or synthesis is like mm -hmm. toward the sort of end that feels really um this part of the effect i think of the third novella for me is that it mm -hmm. was closer to um having yeah. all of that in sort of wholeness as opposed to picking or choosing um and that's yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really exciting. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're getting it all figured out. It's fantastic. Yes, um, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I, I also think uh, like the way in which um, Binti's culture is necessary uh, at the university and out in space too, right? Like her, it's, mm -hmm. it's not just about her learning something and bringing it back. It's that the culture that she has is, is needed even as yeah. far away as this like interstellar university, right? Like what she brings there, mm -hmm. they need to. Um, and that it would be a loss for like intergalactic culture or something like that if she didn't go, you know? And yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. And those are like, I'm so glad to hear that you caught that because it, it's really important. Um, 
it's like like those things binti is very much a narrative about um about culture yeah. you know and it's about identity and but it's in a different way and and it's it's celebrating you know it's celebrating the the old the new and the transformed and, and the combining and and um not just being one thing because we're not all just one thing and i think a lot of those uh a lot of the conflict comes from this this idea of you have to be this or that and right. it's not healthy <laughs> yeah absolutely um yeah i feel like I'm, i can't think of how many times i've made myself miserable making those this or that decisions right i mean like that's mm -hmm. mm -hmm. like part of growing up is stopping doing that or something right like, yeah <laughs> uh, which maybe is part of that too um uh I just wanted to say to the audience who's in the Zoom webinar um, to let you know that we'll start taking questions in a couple of minutes. And so if you want to start asking questions in the Q&A box, those will be there for me to grab to ask Nettie a little bit. So please feel free to start asking questions. Um, okay, um, I, uh, I may just have a couple other questions for you before I open it up. Uh, maybe you can't tell me anything about it. Maybe you can tell me some of the mindset, but I'm really excited for your adaptation of Octavia Butler's Wild Seed, which I, I just really love that novel. It's one of my favorites of hers. Um, I actually read it for the first time uh, immediately before reading Who Fears Death. So when I found out you were, you know, oh, wow. of, I read those yeah. two things like back to back really. And, um, mm -hmm. and I just think you seem like such a perfect person to adapt it. Um, I have never adapted anybody else's work, um, <laughs> but it seems to me that <laughs> working to retell Butler's story in a new medium is really another kind of like mythology adapting or mythology extending that like to take wild mm -hmm. scene view of it as a way of like bring it into the future. Um, mm -hmm. I just wondered if there's like how you're thinking about it or is there, are you trying to strike a, how is the balance between sort of being true to the source material or the demands of a new medium and a new moment? Not that yeah. Butler doesn't fit our moment perfectly a lot. So, you know, but also like, um, how that particular set of mythology or stories you're sort of interacting with? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, yeah, she gave us a lot to work with, so there's right. that. Um, it's been it's been really interesting, I gotta say, because it's like if I don't feel like I could adapt just any Butler book. Like if if, if they came to me and were like, um, we'd love you to adapt Kindred, or we'd love we'd love you to adapt uh, Dawn, I don't think I would do it. Like, I just, I, I don't think I would do it. But like, um, Wild Seed, that one. <laughs> that one I knew, because I understand what it is to adapt something. And you have to have this for, well, I'm sure there have been things we know that have been adapted by people who are not close to the material and don't care about the material. <laughs> so we're not. But for a good adaptation to happen where, you know, I'm not gonna get crucified by Octavia Butler fans. Um, right. I feel like Wild Seed, that one I can, that one I can adapt. That one feels, feels right for me. And um, one advantage that I have is that I've had conversations with Octavia Butler, yeah. you know, and, and there were, and I, there were aspects, and this was, be, you know, I was just, I got to talk to Octavia. So <laughs> I'm going to ask whatever I want to ask. And I did. And um, one of the questions, I, I got to talk to her about Wild Seed. You know, and I got, there were things that I had, there were questions that I had, and this was of course be, well before I even had any idea that I would be doing this. So this was just an advantage that I, that I walked in with. Um, I got to ask her about Wild Seed and, the, and I got to ask her, uh, especially about the, the beginning, which starts off in Nigeria. And there were, you know, there were details that I know, you know, where I'm, I can use that in the adaptation that aren't in the book. So like mm -hmm. that's a that's a wonderful advantage that I have, um, and then just you know it's it's gosh there's so much I can't say. Um, <laughs> geez, all can these say traps are like tra all these questions are like traps. Where I'm trying to get you to tell me all this. Stuff. I know it's like the, well the, not, but when it comes to the uh, adapting something, there's so many levels to it. I of course and, yeah, and it's like there's a lot that you that where you just can't say anything. Yes. But I can say that we have written the, first, the pilot, we've written the pilot for it and, um, and it's awesome <laughs> and it's awesome. And it's taking what's already there. It's taking the story and it's stretching it. It's a TV series and that's the beauty of TV series. You can stretch things out and you get more, um, you go, go in deeper. So like 
with Anyawu and Doro, we've, and I'm co-writing it with um, Wanuri Kahiu. She's the Kenyan film director and she directed Pumzi, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. And everyone should go out and look at Pumzi. It's on YouTube. Um, P-U-M-Z-I. Thank Kenyan you. Kenyan science fiction. Yeah, Kenyan science fiction. It's amazing. Yeah, and it came out around the same time as Hufia's death. So like going in and looking at it with that in mind to be like, wow, those two needed to meet. That's nice. really <laughs> but yeah. So so like when Nuri and I, when we were working on on the, the pilot of Wild Seed, we had to deal very closely with Anyamu and Doro. And so we had to really get into their characters. And if you know anything about the character of Doro, he's not pleasant. <laughs> he's very, very Talk about unpleasant. people that still scare me, right? What a terrifying yeah. presence, yeah. Yeah, so we had to really go into like the, the character of him. There, there's stuff about him that where we had to, we had to dig in and it was, ah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's something. So like, we, it's, it's really, um, to just kind of make my answer short, it's, it, we were expanding a lot. We're expanding a lot, but we're working with what Octavia um, gave us. That sounds fantastic. I can't wait. <laughs> I, I'm going to ask you one more question, then I'm going to open it up to the audience. Yeah. Um, uh, we started out talking about your definitions of African futurism and African Judaism. And I wondered if you could, uh, if there's somebody off the top of your head that you're, you're thinking of, uh, just like other contemporary writers as you think of as like fellow practitioners or fellow travelers, um, where should we be looking for more African futurists, more African Jewish like worlds? Where, where are the, who are well, the people? There's, a, um, there's an anthology that just came out like last just week. Just downloaded it. <laughs> <Let's talk laughs> that. <laughs> that African futurism and anthology and it's free. Yes. And um, it's on the Brittle Paper uh, website. I've retweeted it. Um, it. It should be easy. I don't know the, the link right off the top of my head but that's where you know yeah that's if you if you want to see what some you know other african futurist writers it's right in there i've always uh with with the label even though i, I created the label but i tend to refrain from saying who should be in it i feel like that is the um the work of of scholars you know, I'm a writer of it, so I'll leave that up because, you know, I, wh if I name somebody and they're like, no, I'm not. That's back where you started with Afrofuturist, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. So I'm just like, I'm not even going to, um, I'm not even yeah. going to do that. I'll wait for others to do it. And I think that that anthology is the first, um, first of its kind. So hopefully there will be more in the in the future yes. and then uh i know there was a an essay that was written on uh african future so there are a few things um as, as things progress um um scholars are writing on the topic and then uh there are anthologies and and yeah there are other other um writers who identify with the with the label yeah Thank you so much. Um, I will uh, I'll start taking some questions from the Q&A. So if anyone would like to put uh, questions in, I will start working through some of them. Um, I will. Uh, I think the first question here is one that might just let you geek out about something while I read other questions. So this is from, okay. uh, and I apologize to anybody whose name I, I get wrong, uh, Christian Bovard Abo says, what's one thing that you've learned about mythologies or histories or cultures while researching to write one of your books that blew your mind? Hmm. Okay. One thing that I've learned, I mean, a lot of my, uh, okay, that's a good one. Let me write that down because I'm scatterbrained, but a lot of my, uh, like I don't go in researching mythologies. I tend not to do that. I, I research is a weird beast for me. I tend to just fall into things randomly. A lot of the things that I've learned have been just ran just me being interested in the world. And then I just find things like Insabitty. Insabitty was one um, that I fell into because, you know, when I was in Nigeria, I saw these symbols, these, they look a lot like my own drawings. Like I had adorned this. Oh yeah, nice. Yeah, like they're kind of, it's kind of like that and that's who is definitely. But like, um, I, I had seen these, these symbols when I was in Nigeria and, and like one of the things for me, even before I was a writer, I was always curious about just things like mysteri um, mysterious and cosmology, like things, Igbo things, I was always curious or anything that I would come across um, in Nigeria. And so I saw these symbols and I was like, what are, what are these? And then I learned the, the name of them. Um, and the more I asked about it, 
especially from the elders that I would be called a heathen. And then they, they try to save me with Christianity and all of that. And so then I knew I was on the right path to something <laughs> when that would happen. <laughs> like, oh, okay. This, this is, uh, I'm going to dig deeper in this. I have a word now. And so when I did more research on Insubiti, I learned some mythology about it that, that, uh, According to some stories about Insubidi, and this is something that I used in my book, Czar the Windseeker, where I have the Idiot baboons, that, that Insubidi was taught to um, a group of people, or it was taught to a man in the forest. There was a group of people moving through the forest at night, and they stopped to build a fire. And um, then these baboons came, these really beautiful baboons came, and everyone ran away but this one man. And these baboons apparently taught this man Insubidi. Like they showed him Insubidi. And that was how uh, human beings learn Insubidi. I love that story because one, it was very believable. I could see baboons teaching people. <laughs> <laughs> so they made complete sense to me. Um, but also, it, you know, that whole um, racist stereotypes of, of Black people being like monkeys, it kind of played with that. And mm -hmm. they're learning something something uh it's a magical writing script powerful writing script so they're learning something magical and powerful from the baboons and so I loved like immediately when I read about that that story I was like oh my god this is so awesome <laughs> so yeah that's that's one example of me learning some mythology that just blew my mind because like I was already obsessed with that that writing script and to learn that that was the story behind how people found out like how people learned it was just Oh my God, too awesome. Too awesome. <laughs> I love the way that, uh, that you've just like stayed excited about it since you're using it in the first novel too, right? It's like yeah. the excitement is like undiminished by having yeah. used it, right? Not yeah. at all. Yeah. <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> uh, it does feel like uh, like uh, those things sort of stick with us and, and, and getting to like carry them forward seems really great. I mean, I think the way that um, your like natural curiosity and enthusiasm is like the work of the job too right like you're yeah. sort of already doing it just by being yourself and being interested in things yeah yeah uh uh i have a question about binti uh from elizabeth mendoza um and uh, there's a spoiler alert at the top so i guess you, maybe people have to look away if they want to but uh after reading binti i was struck by the recurring motif of loss of body and autonomy to the medusa and so on I would love to know your right. thoughts on how you frame her transhumanism. Are the changes yeah. that happen to her an act of violence to you or do you view it differently? It's just thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great question, great question. Um, that is like, that theme runs throughout the, the, the narrative with Binti. It's very much, and I think I know where it comes from. I, I know for me, because of like my, my whole background with um, paralysis and all of that, like, if you, ah, it's too much to tell with that. But like, I've been paralyzed before and it was all sudden and it was for because of a surgery that I had and all of that. And that's what, what that's how I started writing, right? So like this, this painful, um, this painful traumatic experience and I still suffer from PTSD from that, mm. um, led me to find this art that I like, I love writing. I can't even, and I don't know if I would have discovered it if that horrible thing hadn't happened. So I'm always kind of thinking about that. And so with Binti, she goes through this and, and like, um, yeah, spoiler alert. Okay, those of you who haven't read it, eventually <laughs> you'll read it and you'll understand. I'm sorry. Okay, so I'm just going to talk. Just pause the um, live stream. Come but, back in like three weeks, you know? <laughs> yeah, it, it's all about the journey anyway. So it's not yeah. about the, you know, so spoilers aren't going to mess up the story. But like, she, she is altered when she, she's, she wants to save this, um, she wants to save herself. She wants to save the, 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 the planet that she's going to from these alien um, or extraterrestrial, because they're not on earth, they're not alien, but from these extraterrestrial beings who have a point in their murderousness, right? And so in order to do that, she has to give something up and she knows like she submits, she submits her, her life and her everything, and, and, and it changes her. So she ends up with, whatever, alien DNA, and, ha and it alters her forever. It alters her forever. And so that's just the beginning. And so throughout that, and so she, she, she's changed because of something that she had to do. She's altered because of something that she had to do. So it is, of course, it's a trauma. It was not wanted by her. 
she didn't know they were about to do it. It's a trauma, but it, it happened. Like, you know, it, it, it happened. And that was how she had, that was the only way that she could save this larger thing, you know? So it's something that she gave up. And, and so as the story progresses, she keeps learning that there are aspects of herself that are being, that are either being altered or are altered. And for her to move forward and for her to evolve and address these things that keep being presented to her, she's getting affected. She's getting affected. And so like, by the time the, the trilogy is over, oh, she's very affected. Yeah. <laughs> she has changed in so many different ways. And it's part of the journey. And in, in a lot of ways, it's like life, the way that life happens where as it moves, you're in, oh, Octavia Butler, who said everything has changed, you know? <laughs> so, um, the, so it's like, she, it's, that's the only consistency. And as she moves through, it's, it's like life. Life changes you inevitably as you move through. In order to live, it, you have to change and you have to be changed and you have to be affected. So like that philosophy was also within, and, and, and yeah, she didn't have a choice in these things. And we don't, we don't always have a choice. That's the real, that's the reality of it. And Binti still moves forward despite all of that. Yeah. So and, yeah, that's something that I thought of, a lot about. So yeah. I love the way um, uh, you talk about like, uh, even though it's not one of the, like, the submission to the experiences, submission yes. to change makes like the, the positive growth out of it possible. Like if this thing had to yeah. happen, then I will accept that or move on or deal with it in some way. Um, and that's yeah. an ongoing process in those books, right? It doesn't just happen. Mm -hmm. And then like now she has like superpowers or something, right? Like it's this ongoing sort of growth into herself that feels yeah. very real. Yeah. Um, I'm it's glad you uh, you in invoked Butler there because I, I just taught Parable <laughs> of Sower in class and then went, oh. uh, went from teaching that in class to rereading Lagoon before I talked to you and to go from her sort of God is changed to your alien showing up and be like, I am changed. And I was like, ah, this is mm -hmm. such a, these pairings are great. You know, it's sort of fun to have <laughs> different sources of change, I suppose, um, in yeah. that place. Um, I, uh, a couple people have asked about technology and Vinti and I think uh, maybe a specific, uh, I don't know, if the, I think this is a technology, but Kate Koppelman asks, I'd love to hear you talk about how math features in Binti. I've tried a few yeah. times to since love the way in which mathematical thinking operates in the novella as intertwining with bodily experiences and with natural world. People also asked about the astrolabes and the Edan and where those ideas came from. But I think the math is so central to that book that, that feels like a fun place yeah. to speak out from. Yeah, um, God, there's so much. There's so much. Uh, what do I just say? Um, before I even forget, with astrolabes, the, the astrolabe was perfected by a woman. And the, where I learned that, I was in the United Arab Emirates, which was a big place. That was where Binti started. We went, went that whole trip there with my daughter, because um, that was where I saw the jellyfish in the lagoon, and that's where the Medusa came from and all that. But um, there was a, a presentation there, and they were talking about all of these inventors. And... Um, all of them were male except for one, and I and I'm forgetting her name right now. I, it was uh, Miriam something, and uh, she had perfected the astrolabe, mm -hmm. right? And the astrolabe, like the moment I saw, there was a woman there who was dressed as her, and she was carrying a big, giant, heavy astrolabe, and I didn't know what they were. I just remember, like, I'm like, that looks like the scene from the Golden Compass. <laughs> 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 Yes. And so like my, my daughter took a picture with her and then I got to hold it. It was heavy and it was detailed. And I was obsessed from that moment on when I saw the thing, I'm like, this thing is for, it's like a G it's like an ancient GPS, you know, and, and, it, and it was beautiful. So, so that was where that, and it had like all these, these um, um, symbols on them. And, and, you know, so that was where, that was where that obsession came from. I'm like, this is an ancient GPS. That's awesome. I'm going to work that into my story. Um, math though, like, like everything is math. So first of all, I'm pretty good in math. <laughs> like that was an area, an area of strength for me. Like I wasn't very good in literature <laughs> in school, but I was really good in math. And like, I, and, and it was like, there's something about doing mathematical equations that, that, that stimulated a part of my brain that was very intuitive. Like I can do I, I could do these mathematical equations very fast if I didn't think about them. Mm. I just, I could do them really quickly. And there's something that always stuck with me about that. So that, so there's that part of it. And then there's this idea that everything is math. All of life is math. All of, um, all of matter, everything is mathematics. 
everything. And like, and, and then you look at the, the insect world and I love insects and like the, the, the shapes that they create and all of that. And, and so like when I sat down to, to write Binti, it just seemed natural. Like the way that her worldview and um, who, just her character. And then the idea, the idea of treeing also, um, one thing about treeing is that, um, so treeing is like her falling into this mathematical trance where she's, you know, and, and she's completely clear when she's treeing, she's completely clear, everything uh, mixing. I'm thinking about the, the pilot episode that we're writing for Binti. Yeah. And, like, <laughs> and the book is just, uh, there's a lot. But um, yeah, so everything is very clear. The way that I came up with treeing was first, the way that I do mathematical equations where I just, I just uh, settle and, and my mind clears and I could just do them. Everything in my mind clears and I can just do the mathematical equation. Everything, everything is like, there's a weird thing that happens in my brain when I, when I do math. It's like everything kind of breaks into the, I'm probably sounding strange right no, now, but like everything great. breaks excited. into <laughs> number, numbers and equations, everything breaks down into those and like I can see it. So that's how it is for me. And so the term treeing though was a tennis term. It's uh -huh. like, um, yeah, it's tennis slang for when you're playing out of your mind, when you can do no wrong, when you fall into this, this state where, and it can last, and I've treed many times, cause you know, I played semi-pro tennis yeah. um, where, where like, if you want to put the ball over there, you want to hit the ball over there, you will hit the ball there. You, it, it's, it's, and sometimes you can see just a little into time. So you can see like a few seconds before it happens. And so like, I, I was very familiar with that phenomenon, that idea of treeing and it's, oh, it's incredible. So I just worked that into the concept as well. So yeah, that's where, that's where it all comes from. Um, the, the mathematics, um, the, ma the idea of mathematics for Binti is very much a part of her character. And I just draw from all of that. Yeah. I, I love that you started off a character like with your own superpower. You just like gifted them. Yeah. Your own, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah actually, a lot great. of the superpowers, like sports help me um, write and just be able to imagine superpowers, like yeah. being in sports. Because like, yeah, like that idea of being able to see through time. I remember when I could see through time that when I was playing tennis, I remember what it was like to treat. I remember what it was like when that moment when I, when I was doing the, the, the high jump where you hit the thing perfectly and you were flying. I remember what that felt like. So when I write about superheroes and, and any character who has either magical abilities or super abilities, I can see it. You know, it's, it's pretty... Um, it's clear. It's not hard for me to describe. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that makes sense too. Like there's all these different ways of being in our bodies and our minds that are, that are giftable to characters, right? Like mm -hmm. characters don't mm -hmm. need as many as like a whole person has, like in some ways. Yeah. It's easier to sort of like use those things. Um, it's really exciting. I think I never really thought about this with Binti, but it's exciting to think about how accomplished she is before her adventure begins because of this yeah. ability, right? Like it's not about mm -hmm. a person who thinks or, or is unexceptional, who goes out and becomes exceptional. It's a person who's exceptional, who, who she is matters and like, and allows things to happen in the world and then becomes more exceptional. But like there's, yeah. she takes like her abilities with her as opposed to going to find them. And that seems really, yeah. same way she does culturally, I think. Um, it seems great. Um, I think we have time for maybe uh, like one more question and I'll, I'll maybe end with a big one for you. Um, this is from uh, Scout. <laughs> Uh, it's, I love and appreciate your clarification of the magical realism label, creating unnecessary otherness to things that many of us have always just lived or known as part of our culture. How would you encourage writers living in a colonized state, which would be most, uh, to still find their voice in and connect to those pieces of our culture in our own storytelling? To do it. That's what, <laughs> like, do it with, without fear. And there's a, um, there's a confidence that is necessary, though. And it doesn't mean you have to walk around like, you know, I'm confident. It, it's more like you, you cannot be afraid to put it on the page. And I know that fear, I know that hesitation. Um, there have been things that I've written where I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm, is anyone gonna listen to, uh, or is, is any, are, what are people gonna think of me when I, if I get the, you know, if they read this. And you just have to shut that voice off completely 
And maybe, you know, of course, you can think about that voice later, but write it first and do not fear, um, don't, don't fear that whole thing of, you know, one, don't fear whether people will want to read your story. Someone always wants to read your story, but also like, don't worry about, um, is this acceptable? Like just, just completely shut that off and, and write it. Like, don't, don't make excuses. Don't tell yourself, oh, you know, this is just too scary to write. I wrote about spiders. If I could write about spiders. <laughs> I knew you were gonna say that. I was waiting for it. <laughs> yes, I wrote about spiders. So you could write whatever story it is that you wanna, uh, that you wanna write. And, and like, just shut your eyes and, and write the story. Like, um, just that, that voice of fear, like in the back of your mind, like just, you gotta, you have to learn how to ignore it. And once it's on the page, and also if you have to, you can tell yourself, oh, no one else is gonna read this, it's only me, but get it on the page, get it out of your head first. Because nine times out of 10, when you do reread what you've written, it's, it's not going to be, it's, you're gonna love it. You're gonna love it, but you have to get to that point first. So like, just, um just write the thing and, and, and write, write it the way that you want to write it. Don't worry about what's hot and what's cool and, and what people will, will all gravitate. Don't think about writing a bestseller. Just write the thing. Write it the way that you want to write it. That's yeah. wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm glad <laughs> you did that in your own work so we can read all these. <laughs> it occurs to me hearing you talk today about all these parts of your books and where they came from in the way that these deeply sort of personal or interests or curiosities or traits become these things that then feel universal to other people. You know, it's like it's your uh, mm -hmm. particular that becomes the universal as opposed to like making yourself uh, making it acceptable or something in some way. Like it's, it's that same close to yeah. the, the actually creates those moments for connection. I'm so glad to have yeah. that in all of your work. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, everybody else. Ayana's coming back I'm in. Here. Here. So here. Magically, I popped back in. <laughs> <laughs> this was amazing, like such an inspiring dialogue. Uh, I can't thank you enough. And I guess I want to end by saying you were both treeing today. <laughs> it was like, I felt like you could Love feel it. that you were in, in sync with each other and could see two minutes ahead. So thank you so much for your generosity. We really appreciate it. And thank you My all pleasure. out there for being in the audience. And uh, we'll see you at our next event. Thanks. Awesome.